final speaker of the day is Mr. Jeff Karadowski. Jeff is Vice President for Hitachi Consulting. He is in charge of the practices consulting arm of the media and entertainment uh, division at um, Hitachi Consulting. He's been with Hitachi Consulting for over 16 years. And he, prior to that, he was with Grant Thornton as a uh, consultant with them. Uh, I know Jeff for several years and he is a very, very intelligent guy. He doesn't like me to share, but have you ever met anybody who scored a perfect 800 or a 1600 on the SAT? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> he's done that. He's also, he's also a former uh, professional beach volleyball player, so no further ado. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, he loves to embarrass me when I walk out every single time. I should never have told him those stories. Um, before I start, yeah, I know Mark, uh, Ed alluded to this before lunch. It's, you know, it's always tough being the last person before everybody's you know, looking forward to the next big thing, which in this case is the panel and probably a ride home and the rest of your evening. Um, and I have a quick story about you know, putting that in context. I was uh, at home talking to my wife yesterday, and she asked me, well, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, well, let me tell you. So I talked to her about this conference, and she said, oh, when are you going on? I said, oh, I'm, I'm right at the end. And I said, you know, I feel like it's kind of batting cleanup. And, uh, you know, so it's my job to kind of bring it home, keep everyone interested all the way to the end, and, you know, end on a, a big high note. And she said, well, you know, I'm, I'm you know, she having been a, an athlete all her life as well, and a huge baseball fan, she looks at all the panel speakers, counts to nine, and says, well, you know, I understand baseball a little bit too, and, and isn't the ninth position where they put the worst batter. <laughs> so it's always good to have someone in your life who will you know, put you back and uh, remind you what's important. So, so anyway, uh, Mark and I talked a lot about different topics for today's discussion. I sent him a list of five or six, and um, this is the one that you know I think we both agreed was probably an interesting, an interesting topic and relevant topic. Um, but when you look at it, you're saying, okay, strategic spending in a down economy. Um, why do I care? So I think if you, you know, think about the, one of the first presentations we had this afternoon was Mike, who former CEO of Patagonia, who I think put it, you hit the nail right in the head. Um, companies are about making money. And it all boils down to, and this is, we've heard a lot of great topics today, talent management, sustainability, um, the, the corporate social responsibility, all these are great topics, but at the end of the day, they're just ideas that we've yet to incorporate into an organization until we figure out how we can make them strategic to our, our business. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that topic today. So I'll, I'll spend just a brief amount of time framing the problem. And uh, it should, after all the presentations today, it should be pretty obvious. Uh, talk briefly about governance. Uh, talk about value. Now, not value in some of the sense that we've heard today around ethics and morals, but more around business value. And, and uh, I'm going to hopefully give you guys a little bit of, of actionable uh, uh, IP here and, and show you a framework that, um, that we've used for a number of our clients in terms of helping them really make tough decisions around what they spend their money on and how can you compare projects um, in a way that's meaningful enough for you to make business decisions. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about you know, how do you make it work in an organization and tools and we'll wrap it all up and uh, hopefully have some questions. So, my goal is to keep you all entertained and in, uh, awake to the end of the day. So, uh, the problem, I, you know, nothing really new on this slide. Um, I think we saw all black slide earlier this morning. Uh, a little gloom and doom from the uh, um, the lunchtime session, at least the first half of it. And uh, you know, I as as uh, I like to to use a lot of movie quotes. People who know me very well, uh, I use movie quotes a lot of times to explain things. Uh, another trait my wife likes to remind me is. Not that endearing, but um, <laughs> uh, I quote a movie, Armageddon, and it's a bad movie, but lots of great quotes. And, and there's a scene in Armageddon where Owen Wilson's, he's one of these kind of layman drillers who's going to go up on an asteroid, and he's going to try to drill a hole so they can put a nuclear device in it and blow it up so it saves the planet. And he's asking Billy Bob Thornton, who's this, you know, sci chief scientist for NASA, so what's it going to be like up there? And uh, the guy you know, goes into this extremely technical... 800 degrees in the sun, negative 400 in the shade, ice stones, and stops him right there. He goes, scariest environment imaginable. Got it. So that's basically, if you put it, you know, one, one line, one quote that summarizes the slide, scariest environment imaginable. Um, yeah, I think we, we all saw some hope and uh, some optimism in the early part of 2010. Unfortunately, the summer hasn't really panned out that way, so you're seeing a lot of companies sitting on cash. So ultimately, the problem is, 
you know, we thought there was going to be a little more strategic spend this year, we're not seeing the budgets really opening up. And I'm working with a lot of customers on their annual budgeting process, and we're just we're just not seeing the amount of, of you know the opening of the floodgates to say, hey, let's you know let's start putting money back into the business. Um, and on the flip side, and I, I, there was an earlier presentation that talked about this poll on both sides, is business haven't, hasn't changed. In fact, the business is actually demanding more. So on the, you know, on, on the business side, you're, you're having this constant pull. Hey, we, you know, we've got competitive pressures. We've got to stay ahead of people. Um, the velocity of business in today's society is just moving at, a, at an incredible pace. And, and because there hasn't been any spending for a couple of years, there's this huge pent-up demand for investment into you know, people, technology, systems, um, all the different parts of an organization in order to make them more strategic going forward. So what we get here is uh, you get to a, kind of an example here of, of the situation that anyone who's been involved with it with a budgeting process is probably very well familiar with. Um, uh, the names and the amounts are changed to protect the uh, not so innocent. But basically, you know, what you can see on the, 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 the request side is you've got 100 million in requests. There's, that's the business asking for all of this type of investment. We need all these things in order to be better, faster, stronger than our competitors. And then you see on the, the 55 million side, that's what finance is telling them. Well, we got 55 million. Make it work. Uh, and, you know, first argument is, hey, you know, last year we spent 57. Well, this, that's, that's last year, this is this year. So what you get into a situation is you've got to figure out... <laughs> $45 million has got to come out of, your, out of your, your list of things to do. So how do you figure that out? So the, you know, the, the trick of this is you know, typically what people refer to as the governance process, and it's really just making decisions. You know, how do you determine whether it's within your department or if it's across your department, how do you figure out what to spend your money on, what's the most valuable to your organization? Now, I, you know, I, I've I, I would say one thing is, you know, I look at IT a lot because IT has been forced to go through this process a lot earlier than most other organizations simply because, you know, they've been under the microscope for years, even when times were relatively good. So they tend to have uh, a lot of these processes ironed out. And, you know, they're never, it's never an easy process. And, you know, there's a lot of different type of governance models out there. Uh, I think you see, you know, a lot of organizations now going from a centralized model where they used to make the CIO be the person who decides which IT projects go in and which, which don't, um, which always made the CIO a very popular person, um, to now they're kind of decentralizing that process and saying, hey, business units, you tell us what's important to you, and IT will just work, figure out um, which of those they can do, and we'll draw the line, and we'll start from there. But um, either way, you're going to still have these challenges, because at the end of the day, you've only got so much spend, and um, the ask is obviously much more than, than what's available. So we get into a situation where we have to figure out what's important to an organization. And you know, that's where we get into the value discussion. So if you look at the dictionary, you know, obviously the, there's a lot of different, different definitions of the word value. One that's probably important uh, and relative to this conversation are, are these two. You know, number one, it's, it's a relative worth or merit. And the relative is the key point there. Is, you know, value is never really an absolute to anything. It's usually value as it relates to something else. And it, as point two um, highlights, it's usually used as a form of trade-off or negotiation. And so that, that becomes really critical, especially when we talk about how an organization is going to spend their money. So I, as uh, Mark mentioned, I've been in consulting 16 years. And um, there are two fundamental truths in consulting. The first is no matter how well we do on a project, um, before our seats get cold and we leave the office, we'll probably be thrown under the bus. Uh, and number two is that no matter what framework or what model you bring into an organization, there's always a cultural nuance. So similar to this, the value structure is exactly that. Value will mean different things to different organizations. So for example, if your company mission is growth um, and you know, trying to build the business, uh, the value of different initiatives are going to be probably more geared towards things that will grow the business. If you're a very mature organization, a lot of your, your, your value is going to be on those types of things that start um, you know, saving you money, cutting, cutting costs, maybe making you more efficient in the long run, um, or maybe cultural factors. Maybe you work for a company like Google who values an innovation and will actually try to figure out that, that the projects that really allow them to do those types of new emerging technologies are, are the most critical to success for them. So you know, part of this is really understanding what's valuable to each organization. And that's part of the approach that we take when we come into 
um, and to help some of our clients as they make these tough decisions. So one of the um, other points I make on this is, you know, value is, is not a one-size-fits-all from an organizational perspective, but it's, you also have to realize that the things that you can do to help your business and are part of your business are also categorized as well. And those categories do affect their, the, the value or the perceived value that they have within the organization. So you'll have you know, the proactive things that are kind of the big swings you're going to make in the market. Those are your strategic. And those typically have you know, a, a more of an esoteric or a high, you know, forecast or an optimistic type of value. You have the, the more reactive types of things you do in order to you know, handle competitors or handle um, you know, regular, uh, some sort of um, market condition. Uh, and you do those types of things in order to kind of play a little bit of defense and kind of make sure that you are adapting your business to make sure that you're as, as competitive as possible in, in a short-term basis. And then you have those things that are just regulatory. You, you got to, you know, whether they're infrastructure, whether they're, you know, government compliance types of things. And, and those, while they don't have, a lot of times people will say they have no value, they do have a value in that they avoid risk and sometimes avoid fines and other types of things that can be detrimental to your business. So, so you know, one of the things you start, start with as a basis is that not all projects are going to use the same value structure. So how do you make heads or tail out of this? So uh, we've got this framework, and this is more of the, the theoretical perspective of it. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about a tactical um, application of it in a second. But, but really, I look at, at, when you're defining value, you've got to look at two different axes. One is you've got benefits and you've got costs. And that's pretty basic. Everybody gets that. And the other side of it is you have your quantitative and you have your qualitative components to value. And if you think about it, the quantitative components, everybody gets that, right? You know how much the project costs. You know that you know, usually somebody, there's some sort of financial calculation, you know, ROI, payback period, um, internal rate of return. There's all these terms that you hear when people talk about spending. And you know, obviously, you, you know, if, when you're dealing with a lot of organizations, they get that. Nobody seems to argue that. But the, it's the qualitative part that I think is the most critical in terms of understanding value of the company. Because I think if you look at the continuum, if you focus just on the, the, uh, the quantitative pieces, you're going to miss the things like the innovation projects. You're going to miss the things potentially like talent management. You know, you're going to do the types of, like you heard from Warner Brothers this morning, you know, they had a project that they were looking at is to actually cut costs out of their supply chain. Um, the customer facing stuff that we just heard uh, saw presented, you know, those are the types of things that actually may have you know, reduced churn and have a tangible output that you can measure. But you know, what about sustainability? I mean, sometimes sustainability efforts um, and corporate social responsibility actually saves you money, but there are other times that that ROI won't be enough to carry a project like that over the goal line. So you have to look at the strategic implication, and there's a protection of the, of the brand. There may be you know, a way that you can use that in order to get out to the market or do something that's different than your competitors. So basically the way we look at it from a kind of a, a theoretical perspective is you've got to look at all, all four of these quadrants. Now, the more interesting thing to remember is that not all of these quadrants are going to be weighted equally. So, again, it goes back to what's valued individually by each company. Some companies may, may push you know, heavy, heavy on the, the financial side and a little less on the strategic side. Other companies may go the other direction. So, again, making a value model work is really as much about trying to tweak it and tune it to the specific levers that each company wants to pull in order to really understand what's important to them. So... What, but the goal, ultimately, is to drive to a single score. And the reason you do this is to start racking and stacking comparing efforts. So don't go write this down because it probably won't work for your organization. But this is one example. <laughs> <laughs> this is very customized. So this is just one example. I mean, it, you know, this is, it just can show you that you take all, all of the different components of the framework and you, you start driving them down to things that matter. So, for instance, for strategic impact, um, that's something where you align with corporate strategy in a couple of key ways, and maybe you give a couple extra points to a project based on that. Um, organizational impact is something that really addresses the risk in the organization. So maybe you have a transformational project, but that project is going to tax almost every group in your company. You need to account for that in that cost. And it's, a, it's not necessarily a quantitative cost, because you can't always measure it, but you realize that the focus and attention of getting something that significant transformation um, in your organization is going to detract from some of the things that might be considered core focus. So anyway, this is one example, and we've, you know, we've done this for a number of different organizations. We started this effort in the IT organizations and drove to this because IT was always trying to figure out a way to go back to the business and tell them why their project got cut. 
Um, this gave them a little bit of a basis to do that. Um, and you know, recently we've been doing it for a bunch of finance, uh, finance departments within uh, large organizations who are now looking at the capital spend and having the same kind of challenges with understanding you know, what's important if I've got X amount of dollars to spend this year, what, you know, what, what is the CFO going to approve? Because um, he's got a fiduciary responsibility to the board of directors and Wall Street a lot. So, um, you know, that's one example. I mean, we've got we've got detailed. Uh, we've done this model, and we'll talk. We'll, I'll show you a kind of a screenshot of what the, the actual model looks like when you put it into, say, an Excel spreadsheet. But you know, understand that looking at value in a way that's not just purely financial, and in some places where there's just maybe not a lot of maturity, looking at value at all as a driver to um, to understand what projects are important and which ones aren't is is kind of a, it's a cultural change. It's and and any kind of cultural change program, and you've heard a lot about change management today, um, relies on a lot of different pieces. So if you notice, and I, we heard this also this morning, is that every major transformational change really depends on people. So if you notice, people smack dab in the middle. Um, I would say about five years ago, before change management was really well respected, well understood, people would have put strategy smack dab in the middle. But I think you know, we've learned. We've learned from what works and what doesn't work, and you tend to see people right in the middle of, of kind of that structure. But it's, you know, in classic consulting form, you have people, process, and tools as kind of the core areas to look at. But then you also have to consider things like data. Um, you know, what, what information is critical? You know, what are the metrics that you're going to use to capture that, that value, um, both from a qualitative and a quantitative perspective? And then closed loop principles. And the reason closed loop principles are really, um, are really critical here is any value model you put, I can guarantee you somebody's going to find a way to try to game it. Uh, in fact, we had, uh, <laughs> we had one organization where sales and marketing uh, had historically screamed really loud every single time they put a bunch of projects out there. And they made so much noise that everyone finally said, just fine, go ahead, we'll do it. Um, and all the other departments were getting a little frustrated because they're saying, well, I don't necessarily know if, if their projects are that much more valuable holistically than mine. So we helped create this value model. And the first thing sales and marketing do with the value model is they went in, they tore it apart, and they tried to figure out how they can jam the score up as high as possible, which wasn't all that difficult. But then we told them, well, okay, all the benefits that you, you structure into your value model are now baked into your next year's operating plan. Well, that changed behavior immediately. As soon as they realized that you know, if they expected X number of new customers, their plan for the following year was expecting them to get that much more in their operating plan. Um, whether they, you know, they're talking about headcount reduction, they had to account for that. So that, that closed loop process immediately changed everybody's behavior pretty quickly and shows you just kind of the impact that, that people do have on this process. So while that looks pretty challenging, and again, a little bit of an eye chart here, but you know, one of the things I would say is making these types of changes, don't do it in one shot, do it in phases. So when we worked with, uh, with, with the organization, uh, the first organization we did this with, we told them, don't, don't bite all this off at once. Recognize that there are certain components that you can start with, then you add other components in. So we focused on, you know, the strategy was really more the vision. Uh, people and process were, you know, kind of really the, the critical piece that they had to address. Uh, and then tools and data kind of fell out of that as a second phase. And then we followed that up with a whole um, kind of reporting metrics analysis and closed loop phase. So, um, you know, recognize that this is, this is a cultural change. So um, we talked a little bit about you know, how do you make this work in real life and what's tactically. And this is an example of one of the, the, the value models we had. It's not comprehensive. It's actually a, it was about a five-sheet uh, Excel spreadsheet um, that they ultimately automated through SharePoint. Um, but the first version of this looked at all the different pieces we talked about. So they had you know, a section for strategic alignment. And when we did that, we went to every single business unit and asked them what their top three the top three goals were for the next year and what measures align directly with those goals. And so this actual model, when you click, to say you were in sales and marketing, and you click new customers, there was actually a computation that was a formula that was pre-filled that used all of the standard metrics that finance used to measure, and they had to add, they had, they basically they entered, well, we think, we think we're gonna have a thousand new customers. Well, and that had a multiplier that drove them to an actual benefit score that they then used to bake into the following year's plan. Um, similar with, you know, the cost structure was, was standardized and, you know, the value of this was it was no longer the back of the napkin type of, of estimation that was done in the past. They used standard, standard processes, standard formats, and standard measurements 
so that everybody, when they were comparing their projects, had at least drove to some sort of financial cost, some sort of financial expected benefit, and then a value score that allowed them to rank them relative to each other. Um, and you know, when you get this actually into a fully automated system, like when we put it in SharePoint, um, you were able to then pull the data out of this and, and make some meaningful analysis. Um, you know, the, the first year we did this, it was a lot of spreadsheet manipulation and a lot of you know, copy paste from, from one spreadsheet to the summarized sheet. Um, we, we automated it in the second year and, and it's actually working quite well. They can now slice and dice it around a variety of axes. Uh, and then, you know, as we mentioned, the closed loop side measured not only the benefit side, so the benefits were baked into the, set, the, the, the subsequent years and future years business plans, but we also looked at the cost side. Because one of the things that happens and one of the natural kind of out, kind of one of the natural kind of fallouts of this is all of a sudden you get a little bit of the finger pointing. So sales and marketing is telling me, oh, you know what, I think it's going to cost X amount, which is going to give me a value score of this. IT comes in, gives them a cost, they, they compute the score. Turns out that the project runs a little bit over budget, so the value score isn't as, 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 as uh, solid. So, you know, we had to show a closed loop on the organizations that were actually executing on the projects and creating those costs, as well as um, those that were kind of trying to drive the benefit scale. So, you have to kind of balance it out and show. And what we, what we ended up doing is we create, you know, in, instinctively you kind of look at this and say, okay, well this becomes now a performance contract. Whereas the performing organizations, whether it's IT, engineering, or uh, HR, finance, whoever's providing all the work and, and creating the cost structure, has an obligation to meet their estimates. But then also the business unit that's, re that's requesting the, the project is also on the hook for trying to make sure that they capture the, the benefits out of this. And it's actually worked. And it created some meaningful dialogue between those organizations where historically you had a lot of, of uh, fairly contentious discussions. So that puts me close to my time, but to kind of summarize, um, and there's, I've got a couple other appendix slides if you know, as we have questions, I might pull some of those up. But, but you know, as you know, kind of to summarize the, the conversation, you know, organizations ask to do more with less. We heard that in a couple other slides. Um, just effective decision-making governance requires trade-offs. Trade-offs require some understanding of value in an organization. And while value is unique to every organization, it's, it is difficult to quantify, but you can come up with models that get you close. And you know, nothing's going to be perfect, but at least it gets you moving from an emotional-based conversation to a more fact-based conversation in the way that you're valuing the projects. Um, and you know, the structure of a value model, intangible, tangible benefits, um, and also cost and, and uh, benefit side. And the, you know, again, Organizations that use some sort of value scoring, you know, again, it's not perfect, um, but it also provides a very good starting point when you're having those discussions. Because every year, when you start having the more or less contentious conversations, and this, the initial time we did this, the CIO came to, our, came to us and said, thank you, I no longer am the bad guy in my organization. Um, I'm now watching my business units have the more meaningful conversations, and now everybody understands why I can't get everything done because they realize how many requests I have and the balancing act that they have to do every single year. And then, you know, last but not least, obviously implementation is, is uh, it's a cultural change. So be prepared for that. And with that, I will open up for questions. Right on time. Yes? Uh, yes, how much influence should corporate boards and shareholders have over the golden parachute uh, packages given to retiring CEOs? Um, that's probably more of a, I have an opinion on that. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, that, that's more of a policy conversation than it is something around this. I mean, I guess you, you could look at, uh, you know, in today's economy, I think we heard about it in the ethics discussion that, uh, you know, clearly, clearly there seems to be some challenges with people um, absorbing the concept of, Huge corporate and executive uh, bailout and parachutes with when most of the uh, most of the people that are actually working hard in the organization aren't getting the same. So I mean, probably more of a political or opinion question than, right. than factual. But. Yes. Uh, question. Um, you know, the, the, the last couple of years there hasn't been a lot of visibility in doing forecasting. How did you find that um, 
Are there any changes you have to make with this model or the frequency of discussions you have to have with this model in order to, to budget and reforecast? And how did that actually occur? Very little visibility going into the Well, the, the interesting thing is this was, this was the first step in the entire analytics kind of change that, that the company made. And um, it's, we've implemented it in two places at a finance um, department level. And, and in both of those cases, they didn't really measure any of these. They, they measured costs relatively well, but they had no concept of how they measure benefits, other than when the finance department aggregated their numbers to go to Wall Street. So what it did is it actually now created you know, kind of a, a sub-network of KPIs and measurements that aligned with the kind of departmental goals and allowed them to really start thinking about their world, not in terms of, you know, hey, here's all the things that I think are great, but here's the things that um, are really driving business value and, and measurable business value in most cases. Um, so, so it was. It was it was a step in the right direction for them. And, and it really was the, the, the end result of this was people started talking about projects, not in terms of, hey, I think this is a great thing to do. It was, well, here's why I think this is a great thing to do. And here's what I think is going to come out of it. So it, it, it was actually kind of a, a maturation process for the organization as a whole.